On behalf of the university and uh, the journal Samtiden, I would like to wish you welcome to this uh, double lecture uh, with uh, Professor John Esposito from the Georgetown University in Washington and Karen Armstrong from the UK. And uh, uh, I cannot express how uh, intensely happy I am that the two of you are here. That's a great privilege for us. Um, Samtiden um, is a journal, as some of you know, which was established in 1890. I'm now its new editor. My name is Christian Kjellstrup. And uh, one of the first things I did as an editor uh, was to think of how to reach you, students. So in an interview with me in Aftenposten, I said, uh, we cannot simply go on with something without engaging you. Uh, because when I was a student, back in the days, we're talking last century, everybody knew about Samtiden. Uh, that is something we cannot take for granted anymore. But there were university professors from this university, Trunberg Eriksson, Thomas Hyllat Eriksson, who were my predecessors. Um, now, uh, this has changed. I do not take it for granted that you even know of Samtiden. Uh, that's why I'd like to meet with you. And um, uh, in this interview with Aften Posten, uh, I, I said this, and I was called by, um, uh, by one of the people who work here for the library, and uh, uh, we decided to cooperate uh, and to make this event for you. So, as uh, you already have noticed, the main topic of Samtiden, which is a journal on political um, uh, questions, cultural questions, is the Quran. Why the Quran? Uh, there are many reasons for that. Uh, I sincerely believe that a focus on Quran is necessary. Uh, to me, it's a paradox that people who are literate and have, uh, who are well read, have hardly any knowledge about the Quran. And if you should have an opinion on Islam, uh, whether you will be critical or not, uh, at least you should start out uh, to, um, to, f to get familiarized with the Quran. For that reason, we have this event, and behind you, uh, my uh, colleague Berit Luisa will sell uh, uh, the last issue of Samtiden, uh, not the Quran. Uh, but tomorrow morning, I will be opening up a pop up shop at Jungstorge, where I will be selling both Samtiden and the Quran in Norwegian translation. So you're more than welcome to come by tomorrow at Jungstorge around lunch. Uh, Pop-up shop will materialize there. Uh, also, before I forget it, I have to say um, this evening at uh, Kulturus, at Jungstorge, uh, there will be the formal launch of Samtiden. John Esposito will be present, Karen Armstrong will be present, a third person, uh, Joseph Lombard from the American University in Sharjah, the Emirates, will come uh, to this event and be interviewed uh, uh, by Osten Seistad. You're more than welcome to join unless you're under 20 because they serve alcohol. So for that reason, they can come. I think that's silly and, and a shame, but that's how it is. But some of you who are under 20 might be here at least. So when I want to reach out with you with something, it's not only that I want you to, to, uh, to read about this important topic. I hope in the future, as students, you would consider writing for something. You would consider writing for other journals as well, not only academic journals, but uh, working on a master thesis, uh, you will have uh, quite a lot of knowledge, and perhaps sometimes it's only your mother or father who will read it. So <laughs> try, to, try, try to get it published. Um, before I introduce John, uh, there's uh, one person I'd like to thank in particular. Uh, I have to thank, of course, the Library of Humanities and Social Sciences for hosting this and doing this beautiful exhibition. You can see various copies of the Quran, uh, with the oldest one, including uh, an issue from 1649. And I'm so thankful uh, for this uh, cooperation, and I believe in it. I think we should have more of this. Uh, this event is also being streamed. And that is about the practical information I have to tell you. No, one more thing. John's lec uh, lecture will last till um, 12.45. There will be uh, a possibility to ask him questions. And then Karen will uh, talk from 45 minutes from 1 o'clock. And there will be a new possibility to ask her questions. Um, I, 
I, uh, I mentioned I want to thank one person, that is you, Sina, Maria. When you called me, uh, since you called me, um, many months ago, we've had some pretty hectic meetings. Uh, it has been great fun. I hope I haven't uh, completely exhausted you. Uh, but without your uh, initiative, uh, this would not have happened. And I thought uh, in the beginning that you were working with communication. And then I transpired, you're, you are a librarian or a fog, a referent. So that, ladies and gentlemen, that's how the future librarians should be like. So I want to give you these flowers. Thank you very much. And now, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, John Esposito has come a long way, a long, long way to stay in Oslo, more or less only today. And I'm so flattered and honored that you're here, John. And uh, both John and Karen are not only, uh, I mean, we're talking Premier League here. They're the Michael Jackson, Annie Lennox uh, of the academic field. Uh, not only that, but in addition to that, I, 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 I really have the strong impression this means a lot to you, what you're doing. You believe in an inter-religious dialogue, and that's the reason why I wanted you here. In addition to your knowledge um, that you, you really uh, are engaged in what you're doing, and uh, you come all this way to the Norwegian fog uh, and rain, uh, I hope you're having a good time here. John Esposito, he has written numerous books. Some of them are exhibited here. Uh, some of them like uh, The Future of Islam or uh, The Islamic Threat, Myth or Reality. You can check them out afterwards. He's also editor of the Oxford uh, Dictionary on Islam. And uh, John, you uh, are going to give us the big picture about the future of Islam and its relation with the West, no less. So the floor is yours and please give John Esposito a warm welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think this is on. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, I have a question. How many of you have seen any of the Iron Man movies? Okay, this is the first Iron Man ring <laughs> produced in the United States. Okay, <laughs> I'm first on that anyway. All right, um, now I'm going to have some introductory comments and then I'm going to get into a variety of topics and, and, and try to stay with it. And in fact, if, if you would signal me maybe about five minutes before, you know, um, let's, okay. let's take a look at, for background, uh, where the U.S. and Europe were in their uh, engagement with or, or sense of Islam and Muslims within their own countries. If we go back before the Iranian Revolution, for example, in the U.S., Yes, there were many Muslims that lived there, but they were just identified by their ethnic background. So-and-so's an Iranian, so-and-so's a Lebanese. Post 9-11, people start talking about Muslim generically. I was in Australia uh, a year ago, and I was briefing um, a, a parliamentary committee there, and the, the chair had been a woman born in Greece, but lived in Australia most of her life. And she made the observation that even in Australia, that when she was growing up, you were Greek, you were Lebanese, etc. but after 9-11, everybody gets put under the umbrella of Islam. That's important in terms of just the way in which we, uh, therefore, when we see something uh, negative happening, that we, the danger is we can brush stroke, okay? But let me give you an idea of, of where, where we were with regard to this in terms of our politics, also in terms of our sense of demographics, um, and even our kind of cognitive, uh, how we, we saw Muslims or didn't see them. In academia, Islam was not taught in most schools, not taught in most high schools, in fact, none, uh, and only in a few universities. Um, in the Foreign Service, training diplomats, there was no need felt to train people in uh, the culture, the religion, etc. At major universities, including the one that I'm at, um, uh, Georgetown, uh, although there was some coverage, by and large, when I went there in 1993, there was no interest in politics and culture. Now that's an in area. Gov uh, uh, if, we, if we take professional organizations, the Middle East Studies Association, the largest organization in America, Middle East experts, American Academy of Religion, no coverage at all, virtually. 
American Academy religion it, it, it deals with all the religions. And yet, when I finished my degree in the early uh, mid-70s and onwards, Islam wasn't present there. And in fact, we had to sort of be vetted, you know, where you'd have a little group, and the question was, could you show that you had something to offer and there was enough uh, interest? I remember as a young academic uh, showing up uh, to read a paper, even after we had our little group organized, and I'd often uh, be stunned that you'd have maybe four people in a room. And probably three of them would walk out after a few minutes. So everything's changed remarkably. Middle East Studies Association, it wasn't until the mid-1980s that its first president was somebody who was a, uh, 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 an expert on Islam. Fortunately, it was me. Um, American <laughs> Academy of Religion, there are only two of us who've been president of the American Academy of Religion. Okay. Government, in terms of training, everything keyed to Iran and post-Iran. On the one hand, Iran put Islam and Muslims on as it were, the front burner rather than the back burner for these constituencies. On the other, though, the engagement with I Iran was in terms of terrorism, export of terrorism, Khomeini calling for the spread of Islam. That's a little bit like uh, generalizing if you only know one ethnic group from one person that you met. Uh, when my wife and I were dating, I brought her home to meet my parents. So when I went to get her, she had no makeup, She's a blonde. I married her for, uh, I was going to say for her body. I mean for her mind. Um, <laughs> I married her for her mind. Okay. Uh, but all of a sudden, no makeup, hair pulled back severely, black dress. Italians only wear black when we were in mourning for a month or so. And she got along great with my parents. And after I asked her, I said, well, you know, why, why did you go that way? She said, well, I know they're Italian. The only Italian I know is our next door neighbors, they're loud, we have almost nothing to do with them, and so there's a kind of presumption about that. In my own family, uh, a mixed marriage in my father, at my father's time was not, uh, not the question of marrying a non-Catholic, but marrying a non-Italian. My Aunt Kitty was Irish, and my grandmother would point, as the men were drinking, she pointed at Aunt Kitty and say, see, see how she drinks? You know, that's the way they all are. Well, when we get into politics and we do that, and particularly, when I get later on, when we get into the growth of Islamophobia, I would argue that's precisely what we do. We brushstroke an entire global community by what a fraction of a fraction of 1% of people do. We engage in a process of collective guilt. That collective guilt approach, it can be seen, not in terms of the, the pragmatic questions that one might ask about a large influx of, of, of immigrants, but when it has to do with a class of immigrants and, and the vast majority of them being victims or when you do a Muslim ban as we uh, were doing in America. Although the new one is a little bit more open, if you still look at it, it's, it's basically a ban that's supposed to be geared towards foreigners. It's a Muslim ban, okay? Okay, uh, but why should we be concerned? There are 1.6 billion Muslims and about 2.3 billion Christians and both are involved in a global religion. So I'm not just talking about extremism and terrorism, I'm talking about life, interaction. Okay, 1.6, 2.3. All right, let's get into the heart of my talk. If Iran was provided the lens through which people began to engage Islam, we also see an emergence of a phrase, radical Islamic fundamentalism. In the 1980s and 1990s, by way of backup to where I'm going, 1980s and 1990s, you had a variety of prominent scholars, Bernard Lewis, Edward Said, and others, who began to talk about Islam. Said identifying in the early 1980s, you know there's, there's an elephant in the room and nobody's acknowledging it. And that is that increasingly, Islam and Muslims are being singled out as a problem, okay? Not extremists, but a problem. For Bernard Lewis and for Sam Huntington, they began to write about a clash of civilizations. At the same time, that it became Islam is a triple threat. It's a political threat, and the idea was look at history. Of course, if you look at history, you could say Christianity was a, tri uh, a, a, a triple threat, certainly to a lot of other countries that 
we invaded and conquered, uh, political threat, civilizational threat, and demographic threat. You know, the, the Muslims are coming, the Muslims are coming. And this was like 20 years ago. Uh, Pat Buchanan, an American politician, wrote a piece that was very influential in the U.S. Um, in which he basically said, in Turkey, where condom is king, you can tell that Pat's Catholic, also went to so Georgetown, but I'd like to block that out. Uh, so where condom is king, Turkish doctors perform abortions on, as it were, native German women. And these doctors have five and six children. So in other words, we've got this small minority. It is proliferating. And at the same time, the indigenous uh, society is cutting back on the size of its family. So you have that notion of demographic threat, which, as you know, has been completely exaggerated. If you look at The Economist, they write an article almost every other year. There's a recent study looking at European countries. People in France think that they have three times more the number of Muslims than they actually have. So if there's an estimate of six to eight million, they believe it's 30 plus million in France. So it shows you how fear can take otherwise rational situations and blow it out of proportion. 9-11 became a turning point in terms of a more global fear. And we began to talk about global terrorism. Okay. ISIS has increased that. ISIS and its agenda and the barbaric acts that it commits, not only in the Middle East, but also coming into Europe. At the same time, we forget that both Muslims and non-Muslims are threatened by groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS. In fact, the vast majority of victims of terrorism are, in fact, Muslims in Muslim countries. Tens of thousands of people being killed, forced to leave, etc. That gets blocked out. At the same time, for more than 20 years, but increasingly, uh, it's become much more exponential today, far-right ideologues, political parties, media political commentators, and religious leaders conflate mainstream Islam with terrorism. We certainly see that today in terms of the recent elections in the States. We see that written up in terms of the coming elections in the Netherlands, in France, etc. So what we see then is a brushstroking of an entire community, and what that leads to is provoking and, and promoting this idea of a global threat from a global community. It undermines our ability to move beyond the notion of a clash of civilizations. If you want to say there's a clash between the civilization of ISIS and the West, that's one thing. But when you say clash of civilizations between us and them, a Judeo-Christian tradition versus an Islamic tradition, that's extreme hyperbole. And to say a Judeo-Christian tradition is extreme hyperbole. Because prior to World War II, we didn't talk about a Judeo-Christian tradition. We didn't talk about it in theology, in our societies. Why? Because basically, historically, we were anti-Semitic. Or certainly thought of Jews as very much the other. So you see how you know, we can kind of conflate this and, and, and feed without having any accuracy behind what we're doing. What we then contribute to is what has become a growing situation of discrimination hate, and hate crimes and violations of civil liberties of Muslims in the US and Europe. I'm talking primarily now about the US and Europe. And we see this exponential growth. This is especially today. Today we are at the highest uh, that we've ever been in terms of the power of Islamophobia. Um, and although it's later in my talk, I'll talk about it now, which means after a while I won't have anything to look at. Um, but let me just, because I'm going to use the term. When we use Islamophobia, a phobia is a fear that's exaggerated, okay? This is why Islamophobia works in terms of the discrimination. Um, and how does that play out? Why is there an exponential threat? Let me give you some, uh, some facts. Media Tenor, T-E-N-O-R, a uh, major uh, monitor of media based in Switzerland, it monitors European and American media, did a study of 975,000 pieces of media. 975,000 pieces of media between 2001 and 2011. And they looked at that media and said, you know, where's the coverage of Islam and Muslims? And what did they discover? 2001, 2% 2 on extremism. 
0.1% on, if you will, the broader Muslim context. You know, what's going on in the Muslim world, uh, Muslim families, contributions of Muslims, you know, regular stories, okay? 2% versus 0.1%. 2011, 10 years later, 2% jumps to 28%. The other side remains at 0.1%. Now you've got an incredible disparity. Its more recent study of 2015, uh, consisting of something like 675,000 pieces of media, looking at, uh, at the US, Europe, and Germany, found that eight out of 10 media pieces were on violence and extremism, where that was the way it presented in terms of Islam. Even with the mainstream coverage of Muslims, it tended to lean towards being on the conflictual. Let me show you. A reporter says, well, we, I am covering mainstream. So he goes and interviews a family about, in your mainstream family, are there any extremists? Are there any terrorists? Rather than the, the, the coverage of mainstream media being one in which people in a country actually know who the Muslims are in their country. What professions are they, are they in? Uh, what kind of uh, interaction in interfaith? Uh, polls that, you know, is their attitude the same as the non-Muslims in the country with regard to pluralism, uh, with regard to being concerned about extremism and terrorism? Most people don't realize that, that Gallup data, the Gallup organization studies of the uh, world polls that, that represent what a million Muslims in some 35 countries uh, thought, and this was done from about 2005 to about 2008 or 2009, showed that Americans and people in the Muslim world had similar concerns, security. Similar concerns in terms of their families, their economy, people's education. It also showed, uh, because we always say, you know, they hate us, and why do they hate us? People accuse George W. Bush of saying that. You don't have to accuse President Trump of saying that because he said Islam hates Muslims. Which is interesting since Islam is a kind of concept, but anyway. Um, the, the fact is that what, what the data wound up showing, when Muslims were asked, do you admire anything about the West? Majority said we admire education, economy, freedoms, democracy, and also said that's what they want, okay? But when they said, what do you dislike? Denigration of Islam and denigration of Muslims. The idea that Arab and Muslim life is cheaper than other people's lives. Well, why might they say that? Take Iraq. The US and UK invaded in order to bring democracy and then occupied. The person who was handling it on the US side when there was a debate about law said, it, the American said, it's not law until I say it's law. Take the hundreds of thousands who were killed and or injured. We have statistics on that and they are phenomenal statistics. On the other hand, when Secretary of, of, of Defense Rumsfeld uh, was asked about casualties, he said, we don't know. When numbers came out from independent organizations, he said, they're incorrect. You don't know, you haven't been able to get your own statistics, but you know it's incorrect. And yet, we could track every American who was killed or injured. We had the ability to, but we avoid that. That's what communicates that. I should also mention that um, I haven't been feeling well for about a month, so I may uh, pause for a second. Um, my mind's not working the way it usually does, or at least the way I think it usually does. Um, so, when majorities of Muslims, you know, again, remember, when they were asked what they admired about Western values, it was things like self-determination, freedoms, etc. So it was identified as Western values. It's obviously not a hatred of the West. You know, people in, in Western countries, in America, they'd always say something like, well, look, they all hate us, so why do they want to come here and go to school? or on vacation. Well, as my dad used to say, you're too bright to be that stupid. If you say that, you ought to think about that. You know, if they all hate us and they're coming here and they'd like to get a green card, they want to work, they're coming here to study, and then after they get their degree, many of them stay, it must be that they don't simply hate us in this kind of deep-seated uh, indigenous uh, approach. Another question has to do with 
people raise, you know, saying um, Islam needs a reformation. Mm -hmm. Islam may need reformers. It doesn't need a reformation. Why? If you actually study the reformation, it was bloody for decades. Lots of Catholics and Protestants were killed. And I know from my history that the Protestants were wrong, and they did it all to we Catholics. Can't understand why they're so barbaric in Northern Europe and the UK, but that was the case. When I grew up, I wanted to be a Boy Scout. We had an Italian Catholic Scoutmaster. There was still a problem of whether or not I could be. Why? Because the Boy Scouts met in the basement of a Methodist church. For Catholics, if you wanted to go to a wedding in a Protestant church, you had to get permission. But this is the basement. And then I finally realized what it was. It was if it's in the basement of a Methodist church, a Lutheran Methodist church, then it means my sons are going to run into Lutheran kids. You see, that was the real issue. You know, when you tease that out in terms of, you know, crossing those, those sort of, uh, you know, cultural lines. So reform is what's necessary. Reformation is a Western term. It brings all the baggage that comes with it. And so what can we say about that reform? On the one hand, we see significant movement for reform, both in the Muslim world and here, but by a vanguard of reformers, a minority. This is not surprising. Reform movements usually start with a minority. When we had Vatican II, you had to look for 40 years before on the way in which reform-minded theologians were silenced, forced out of their jobs, told they should not write books, etc. by the Vatican. You had to look at a Roman Catholic Church that until Vatican II uh, basically was suspicious of democracy, a free press, interreligious dialogue, etc. So you had a vanguard and that vanguard then had to bring about change. And that vanguard had a problem. Why? Because most of the religious leaders and the population had been raised with a certain theological exclusivist worldview. We're right, you're wrong. We're going to heaven, you're not. Or at least, we're not sure. Okay? In the Muslim world, you see that same kind of tension. Reformers face formidable issues as they try to respond to the demands of our times to marginalize extremists, to promote gender equality, religious pluralism, and human rights. They have ultra-conservative clergy, ultra-conservative clergy, but they also have extremists, okay? And in many ways, they're caught between a rock and a hard place. The ultra-conservative clergy train the training of clergy. Those clergy go out into the churches, in this case, the mosques. They then impact the family. The family now's understanding of its religion is with this very conservative and often old world. You know, when you, when you look, for example, at... Um, just want to check the time. When you look, for example, uh, at the nature of many communities, about 15 years ago I did a TV show, and it was one of these new beginning shout TV where the guy really is an aggressive interviewer and everything's aggressive and you push back, etc. So he called me up and he said, we're doing this uh, interview in New York and can you give us an idea of a, a Muslim leader? So I got him some names, I called him up, he said, no problem, I, we got somebody from the city, from New York City. I thought, great, they, they have a cosmopolitan Muslim leader. I walk in, this guy was probably from Bombay and hadn't left Bombay. <laughs> he may have been in the States for 10 years, but he lived in a community and he only served a community who were speaking and culturally from that area of India, okay? Now, you, you, that becomes an issue when you're then talking about the worldview that's presented, when you're talking about the young people that are born, and on the one hand, are, and wanting, having the American experience and fitting in, and on the other hand, may have an imam whose interpretation of religion, but imposing it on culture, you see, makes it very, very uncomfortable to feel you can have that identity. I have a good friend, Sudanese, married an American woman. I went to the wedding. She wore a pantsuit, covered modestly. Then she asked to see me about six months later. She came in, long flowing robes, hair covered, which is fine. And I said to her, but why did you change your outfit? She said, well, actually it was my husband and his friends. They explained to me that um, I should have more Islamic dress. So I looked at her and said, they're right. If you're a Sudanese, this is Islamic dress. If you live in Bangladesh, or in Pakistan, forget it. 
A Bengali woman wears a sari. Unlike Pakistan, a Bengali woman shows her midriff. I, once did, uh, I, I spoke at the most conservative uh, university in Saudi Arabia, and there was a, I guess I, I didn't do this. People negotiated for about six months for me to speak there. So I went there, and um, I was vetted, and I was, it was a big hit, really went well. I, I wasn't surprised. <laughs> uh, um, but no, given my age, I call myself the Mick Jagger of my profession. <laughs> I once actually lectured to 250,000 people, so it reinforced that sense. <laughs> but, <coughs> ah, excuse me. Uh, uh, no, 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 that's okay. No, no, that's what old people do. Um, <laughs> I'm almost 77, and I run six or eight miles, but not today. All right. So let me get back to, let me get back to the heart of th this reform situation. When you've got that pull and push it creates a real problem. And the, and the danger is that, that, that kids have an identity crisis. Now, when I say identity crisis, it doesn't mean that they become terrorists, etc. We can talk about young people and terrorists. We all have had identity crises. For me, going into a monastery at 14, leaving at 24, but having to live with Irish people coming out of an Italian background was a total identity crisis. <laughs> because what they defined as normal, their sense of Catholicism, their sense of my culture, I felt like I was living in a foreign culture. You know, let alone growing up with people who felt because I'm from Brooklyn that I must have a mafia connection. I'm also from southern Italy. Turns out my home village is right next to a mafia village, but that's another story. <laughs> okay, so this struggle then of reformers is up against multiple realities. The religious establishment, okay, and it's being tending towards conservatism, not all but also the governments in the region. The vast majority of governments in the Muslim world are authoritarian. Again, if you say it shows that Islam's incompatible with democracy, then my dad kicks in again. You're too bright to be that stupid, okay? If your leader is a king, military, ex-military, if their legitimacy is based on their security forces, then the fact that you don't have a democracy is not that, or, you know, or if you will, self-determination, is not because people are against it. I used to say when people would bring that up all the time, you're absolutely right, you know? Your average Muslim, my friends wake up every morning, they say, thank God I don't have, I have an authoritarian ruler. I don't have to worry about what I'm gonna do today. I don't have to worry about what I'm gonna say or not say. I don't have to worry about a job because with authoritarian governments, many of them will get me some sort of low-level job. And I just don't have to think and worry about this stuff. Well, it's insane if you think about that. And we saw it with the Arab Spring. Because remember how when bin Laden was out there and people thought, oh gee, he's, gonna, he's getting popular with the youth and there's gonna be this wave and bin Laden's gonna lead. What happened with the Arab Spring? Who went to the streets initially? It was young people not going to the streets uh, for religious reasons. And in fact, the major Islamic movements that ran in elections later did not initially run into the streets. And they were calling for democracy, self-determination, less corrupt society, and freedoms. So the nature of the society also uh, plays uh, into it. Let me then deal briefly uh, with uh, and concretize it for you in terms of the Arab Spring if we're talking about Muslim-West relations. If this were Bombay Sapphire, I'd be in better shape, but anyway. For those of you who don't know, it's the blue bottle. Okay. When we look at the Arab Spring, people were stunned. The rulers were stunned. The young people that went in the streets were stunned. If you talk to the people who went in the streets, the young kids, they thought it would be a, a demonstration, get on social media, maybe government, in other words, to show that there was a problem. No one expected that you'd bring down Mubarak in almost lightning speed, that you'd bring back... Ben Ali, remember, Ben Ali, for example, would run in elections where he would win by 99.1%. And then he once won by 95% and got nervous, okay? Both Mubarak and Ben Ali controlled elections. Mubarak had more of a facade, so the percentages usually weren't as big. But in fact, when you had elections, op there, there were, opposition parties were limited in terms of the number. They were not allowed to have any access to media. They could not have public meetings. And in general, if you were known to belong to these groups, there was a good chance you'd be fired from your job. Majority of jobs in many of these countries, in education, in government, etc., are in fact government controlled. So after the Arab Spring, 
my center at Georgetown, uh, joined with another center in Turkey, and we invited a lot of these young people, as well as leaders of the different Islamic movements, the Muslim Brotherhood, Anahta from Tunisia, to talk about the Arab Spring and what they saw, what they hoped for. However different their comments were, they agreed on two things, two problems, and they came back to us more than once. By us, I mean me and about two other people. There was a woman from the EU and another person because of the nature of the questions. Number one, they worried about the deep state, meaning, as one of them said, when you had your revolution in America or the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution, the winners won, the losers died, were in prison or fled the country. In our country, the military is still in place, the police are still in place. Media is still in place, uh, a media, you know, uh, uh, control media. Uh, the bureaucracy still in place. The shakers and movers who were close to the government and, you know, the, the mega wealthy people still there. So their concern was how are we going to, even with open elections, how are we going to have a functioning government? I always say that Morsi never was president. He never controlled the government. He was a president, but not in the way you would think of a president. How can you be the president of a country when, in fact, you're subject, as it were, to the military, to the, to the, uh, to the courts, etc., all of whom were appointed by their predecessor? The second thing they were worried about and they asked about is, will the West ever accept the results? Will, if we have elections, will they accept whoever we elect? Now, why would they say that? Well, if you look at Gallup data again, an overwhelming majority of Muslims who say they want self-determination and democracy believe that the West was against that. And they had proof of it. George W. Bush and his administration, I'm not attacking Bush on this, his Secretary of State, his Deputy Secretary of State, gave a speech after the first term of the president in which basically what was said was that America had practiced democratic exceptionalism when it came to the Middle East. That all presidents before him, that is presidents that would have dealt with the modern Middle East, including Bush in his first, had in fact promoted self-determination in former Soviet countries in Eastern Europe, etc., but did not in the Middle East. And in fact, kept very close ties with authoritarian governments. So what actually happened if we talk about Muslim-West relations? You had an uprising in Egypt, you had a coup. The U.S. Uh, President Obama never would refer to it as a coup. The code for that was if referred to it as a coup, it would mean that America could not give aid to Egypt, the coup government, even though supposedly we don't like coups, okay? The EU was upset. And its words were upset. And occasionally there was a visit to Egypt. But where did you see the US and the EU say, we don't accept that government, that coup, because elections were coming up. And in a democracy, you win an election, you get turned out by an election. That never occurred. And at first, we were distant and acted as if we were looking the other way askance. But everybody knew after a month or two, it would be business as usual. And if anything, the relations are even tighter than they were before. Okay. So, the message that is sent then in terms of the, the response of the, of, of the U.S. and the EU was, in fact, concretely to, uh, to, to reconfirm the fact that there was uh, a, a problem there. Let's move now to the Trump administration. Oh, good, I'm staying with my time. Where's my timekeeper? Okay, I have 10 minutes? Good. Okay, we'll do five minutes. I'll end it there, then I'll talk about myself for five minutes. And then we'll go to any other questions you have. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at the Trump administration. If you're an outsider or if you're a Muslim, let's say you're a Muslim in America. You don't pray. You're, you know, you're very secular oriented, but you belong to a Muslim family, let alone Muslims who do pray. Where do, what do you think you're going to see when it comes to profiling and you see the bans, etc.? Okay, so you see an election where and by the way, Islamophobia always spikes in the U.S. when there's an invasion, as with Iraq, but particularly our presidential elections, going all the way back to 2006, okay? And then 2010, then 2012, 
and then 2016. In the last two presidential elections, a significant, at least half the Republican candidates have a track record, both before the election itself and during the elections, of, uh, quote, raising, you know, this, this dangerous thing. And of course, they usually do it in terms of Sharia. You can ask me about that. We have more than 20 countries trying to pass anti-Sharia legislation. And guess what? Not a single Muslim has talked about wanting to see Sharia. No Muslim organization has been talking about banning Sharia. And in fact, we can get into what Sharia means later on. Or you can buy my book that's coming out next year, what everyone needs to know about Sharia. So let's look at the Trump administration. You look at an election in which the president who won is asked by Anderson Cooper, of what he thinks about Muslims and Islam, he says, Islam hates us. And then he's pressed some more, and he repeats that. Let's look at the people who are now in the administration. Steve Bannon, who's his chief strategist, was also, un in the unusual uh, way, appointed to the National Security Council. That usually doesn't happen. So Bannon's a very powerful person. And in being appointed there, you never had a member of the NSC coming from the White House that way. It marginalized the, the representation of the head of the CIA and the head of the Pentagon. Think about the implications in terms of, and Bannon is really one of the key ideologues, okay? If you look at the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, the, uh, the head of the Justice Department, um, if you look at who used to be the key man on the National Security Council, General Flynn, who had to leave, and if you look at a number of other people, however different they are, you can find on YouTube or in writing before the elections, that is, in their recent history, people who say Islam is not a religion. Now, again, that's an interesting thing. You might want to say this religion is dangerous or whatever. It's wrong to say that, but Islam is not a religion. How do you declare this isn't a religion? And how do you say that to the majority of people who say it is a religion? And, and a majority that say, you know, I don't get involved, involved in politics and I pray five times a day, I fast, etc. But it's not a religion, it's a political ideology. Because once you say it's a political ideology, you don't even have to say in this case it's a dangerous. None of them, they say a political ideology, then they say, and that's what makes it dangerous. And therefore, that opens it up to doing anything that you want. I mean, in terms of a ban, you know, in terms of uh, greater profiling, uh, in terms of, if you wanted, uh, uh, monitoring mosques, etc. So you have that commonality in what these very different uh, people say when it comes to how they view Islam and Muslims. Where do you see a single Muslim appointed to any position in the Trump government so far? If they have been, it's, they're invisible. What does this mean for the future? I would argue that the danger is, if you look at Europe and America today, at a time when we do have to deal with fear of domestic terrorist attacks, but let's keep that in perspective, too. The thing about domestic, you know, if we didn't have asymmetric warfare, that is, if we didn't have what we now have, where one person can strap on grenades or whatever and blow things up, but rather armies were meeting, we wouldn't be worried at all. In other words, if you're looking at an ISIS and saying, no problem, 20, 30,000 30, people, you know, this isn't really global. But the fact that they can have followers in a country two, three, four, commit their actions, okay? But still, and, and I want to make this clear, I am not denigrating the numbers. Still, we're not talking about the kind of numbers that come when you bomb cities, et cetera, and you have that ability uh, to do that. But what it does is it throws it out of proportion. And when we look at domestic politics and the people that are running in Europe and America or the, the strength of far-right parties, the implications if they have power, and even if they don't, even if they come in number two, they're going to be significant political players. And what does that mean? It means that we have a, a, a rough road ahead. Uh, so the problem is, and this came up, I was speaking at the House of Lords a couple of weeks ago. The problem is, the usual thing when you speak, you say, there's light at the end of the tunnel. There is no light at the end of the tunnel. The guy who chaired it, who's a member of the House of Lords, said, and if there is light, it's an oncoming train. Okay? Mm -hmm. But there is light at the end of the tunnel if we talk long term. Increasingly, America's an example, but also Europe. America, I don't know more. I study Europe, but I don't, I don't live here. In America, look at what happened when the ban went in. 
That very same day, thousands descended on airports. And who were they? They weren't a vast majority of Muslims. Yeah, they were Muslims. They were people from Black Lives Matter. They were people from human rights organizations. They were people from uh, other NGOs, all of which in the past would have just worked on their constituency, now realizing that there is this significant threat to the principles and values of their country, okay, and, 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 and those principles and values, and that now is more and more mobilizing people. There's more and more of a consciousness and, and a movement to do that and continue to do that. Um, uh, and we've seen it with everything from uh, demonstrations at a library to demonstrations outside the, the White House. Our challenge, those of us that are here, uh, and those of us who are bright enough not to be taken in my dad's phrase, our challenge is to be more involved. The number of Americans now that are, are saying, gee, I didn't vote. The number of women who didn't vote. Okay. The number of Muslims who didn't vote. The number of blacks who didn't vote. And realize that if they had gotten out that vote, remember, Hil Hillary won by almost three million votes. She lost the Electoral College. She had a larger percentage than most other, than occurred in most previous presidential elections. That's why Mr. Trump, although he got the electoral vote, is concerned about the numbers on the other side. So we have that as, as citizens of our own country, uh, a need to move forward. I'm, 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 I'm uh, over time, but I wanna say one word about a conversation I had recently with a Danish reporter for an article that was supposedly published last weekend. Very long uh, uh, interview. He said to me, he expected 20 minutes, we did two hours. But at one point, we got into a lot of these questions, at one point he said to me, I said, because he said, uh, I, I was asked, how long do you think we'll have this problem? I said, 10 to 20 years, probably more 20. He said, as I look at Denmark, it could be 30 years before you know, we really get out of this and Muslims are really, a, Accepted, and this isn't just a Muslim issue. Remember, you know, um, this especially when societies become more ethnic and multi-religious. In America, you can say to people, you know, look at what's happening. The irony is that you can have second-generation ethnics, Italian and others, who suddenly act like they came over on the Mayflower, and they don't want any more foreigners coming into the country. Okay, thank you. Sorry, John, for uh, comparing you with Michael Jackson. You said you'd be compared to uh, Mick Jagger. So at least I got the initials right. Um, I also sing the song, I'm so vain, when I go to breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> Is it on YouTube? <laughs> okay, uh, any questions for John Esposito? Uh, if so, you should raise your hand, and there's a gentleman over there, and there's a microphone for you. You should probably S enter the floor again, John. So, um, Newsweek magazine posed a question why did they hate us four weeks after the attacks on 9-11? On um, that's not a glib question. It, 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 it is an honest question. What were the religious motivations behind uh, these 19 hijackers to uh, pose as, as uh, you know, people on work visas in, 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 in America? Mm. And uh, is there a right way to ask that question. I mean, the 9-11 Commission report didn't barely touched the religious or, or, the, or the political motivations. It barely touched, yeah. you said. So, Is uh, that what you said? It barely yeah, it, touched? It, it barely touched. I mean, the 9-11 Commission report was 1,500 pages and, and really didn't go into the, the motivations uh, of the attack. So yeah. um, is there a right right way to ask that question. No, I think, I think it's a legitimate thing to say, why do they hate us? I think you also want to think about the fact that the 9-11 Commission did not front religion at significant. Now again, is it that they're dumb, that they don't know? No, because the two major, uh, I, the two, well, among the two ma uh, the, the major drivers, the two guys behind it, who continue to now speak out, and they speak a lot about Muslims, etc., and even with regard to Trump, you know, basically, there's no doubt about the fact that, for example, people who shout Allahu Akbar and kill people 
are, from their point of view, they're legitimating what they, they're doing in the name of religion. But does that mean that this is true for the religion? Okay? What Breivik did, okay? should one draw, he was a Christian, he talked about his Christian identity, he had a real problem with all of them. Okay? One distinguishes that out. When somebody walks into it and, and it blows up an, abo an abortion clinic, they don't walk in. Well, yeah, maybe they kill themselves too. No, usually we're much better than that. The people that do it are smart enough not to kill themselves. They stand outside. But when, when you see the, uh, Christians doing this or when you see radical Jews uh, in some of the areas of Israel engaging, we don't attribute it to the religion. We will say that they're using religion to legitimate it. So asking why do they, that's fine. You know what I mean? Uh, I'm, and I have a problem when, when one says Islam hates us. I don't have a problem if you say some Muslims hate us, some Muslim organizations hate us. But it, it's the idea of lack of proportionality and, and, and creating a kind of collective guilt that I think is something that we have to worry about. Anybody else? Yeah, you, you're supposed to call on, but anyway, yeah, go ahead. Just go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you for your presentation. I, I have a question about, um, you have a focus on uh, Islamophobia, but is there a legitimate case for... Can you for move the mic just a little closer to your mouth? Yeah, is there a legitimate case for, for just fear of Islam? Oh. Um, because we, when we discuss religion, we always, we're always take, talking about Islamophobia and acceptance, and there's nothing in between. Um, Whereas uh, you named um, Iran and Ayatollah Khomeini, who uh, who called on the world's conservatives, the conservative religious people, to get together. Mm. Um, this, I can answer you. I, there, there's no problem with saying there's a problem, you know, with uh, Khomeini, you know, during the Iranian Revolution. Problem with Khomeini and his followers, from my point of view. There's no problem with saying that Baghdadi. Um, and, and his followers are, you know, are a problem. It's when you say that it is Islam that does it. It's Islam that they refer to, but they're hijacking their own religion because, we, as I said before, you know, it would be wrong to say of Breivik or a lot of other people that they are, you know, that they represent Christianity when they do what they do, even if they say that that's what they're doing. Uh, why don't you give them a short follow-up? Yeah, um, uh, this is just my point because um, if if we were talking about uh, conservatism, where where uh, also Christian conservatives they will be against divorce, for example, and denying women their mm. their rights uh, in that way, and then I would argue that Christianity is, in some effect, um, the vast majority of Christians uh, in the world will will be supporting the. Uh, uh, the, the, the generation of women's rights. Well, the, yes, for me, in a democracy, people have a right to hold their positions. And so in America, I may not like people who are um, anti-abortion or even, excuse me, <coughs> who have a problem with women's rights, etc. But they have a right to do that, uh, whether, whether, whether they're secular or religious, okay? Um, and even though I may find it ab abhorrent, or, um, they have a right to do that. I wouldn't, but I don't brush stroke everybody. So yeah, you know, people may not like the conservatism, let's say, of some Muslim cler clerics, but look at the conservatism of, of evangelicals and Baptists, many of them. And those of us who, for example, really say, hey, to live in a modern pluralistic society, inclusivism is the way, not exclusivism. Yeah, and then we ought to figure out how we make that happen. But we don't make that happen by denying those people who want to take a more conservative approach, you know, uh, denying them their rights. And one of the great ironies in America is that the politicians, many of them, and some of the religious leaders uh, who are Islamophobic, who say things like, Islam is evil. And again, let me make it clear. Criticizing Islam and criticizing any religion is not a problem if it's based on empirical facts, okay? okay. But the reality of it is that what, what we need to do is to realize that you've got that conservatism. The Gallup poll showed that more than 45% of Americans believe that our laws should be based on the Bible. Now, for some people in America, they'd say, 
oh my God, we should leave the country or we better figure out a way to silence these people, you know? Or we still have schools and churches that, that you know, that, that deny evolution, et cetera, you know? Uh, uh, all of that is a matter of actually be played out in society, the conservatism and those issues, rather than simply uh, identifying, in this case, one religion and brushstroking it. So, I mean, for example, uh, people who say uh, uh, Muslims want to impose the Sharia, where's the empirical evidence? And look at who's behind bringing that up you know, writing all of that stuff, what's their agenda? The fact is, you don't have, Oklahoma was the first state, something like 76% of the people in a referendum, I think, voted against it. I was lecturing in Oklahoma, and you know, the professors in Oklahoma were saying, most people in the state don't know anything about Islam. But, you know, they, they, there's where there's an Islamophobia, and that's what's dangerous. That's a question over there. Hi, you've discussed how we should not broad stroke all Muslims as being motivated to terrorists. But I want to look at the extremists, Boko Haram, uh, Baghdadi and his followers, group them together if we will, which we shouldn't. Yeah. You seem to be discussing them as though they are motivated by religion. Yeah. What is the role of desires for sovereignty, anti-colonial claims, and non-religious motivations, which actually I think personally it's completely incorrect to even label the extremists purely as being driven by Islam? No, I mean, you're absolutely right. Uh, I, I was focusing on the issue of, of, of brush stroking Islam and Muslims. And so, I mean, the primary drivers, uh, we see it again in Gallup data, um, or if you look at the kind of stuff that I've said in my book, Future of Islam, and a lot of other stuff that I've written. Primary data that we know is that religion is not the primary driver. It's political, economic, and social circumstances. Same thing's true with anti-Americanism. Yes, there is anti-Americanism, in the Muslim world. There's also anti-Americanism in a lot of the non-Muslim world, okay? But that anti-Americanism is based on how the U.S. is perceived in terms of its policies, its use of force, military intervention, its neo-colonialism, et cetera. And those are basically the primary drivers. In fact, Gallup did a, a survey on, uh, on uh, asking Muslims about jihad, you know, legitimating it and not legitimating it. I'm gonna go a little slowly because my mind is, is lagging. Um, and what, what was discovered was the people who supported jihad, the primary reason they gave were political, not religious. The people who said militant, I'm talking about militant jihad, the people who said on jihad uh, in a terrorist way, wrong, were quoting the Quran and quoting religion. So it's re it really is the political, the, the, you know, the political drivers. And that's why, the, the reason why I worry is that in the Muslim world, the political situation's gotten worse. Mm -hmm. Authoritarian regimes have become more authoritarian because they're scared. Those that have money throw money at it, but they also increase their security forces. The US, the UK, and a number of European countries have actually become less critical of their allies in the Gulf, some of the Gulf states, and in fact become gotten cozier and sold more arms and done some bombing for them, etc. So we've got to worry about an international situation in which um, we're, we're we're acting as if security and stability are not about what's causing the security and stability, but by having a lid put on it by authoritarian regimes. And the reason why we don't want to ask those questions is that we'd have to be asking them about our allies, uh, some of whom are great oil producers, some of whom sell us a lot of stuff, and, uh, you know, and, and that becomes uh, an issue. In fact, it's sad to say, I can't remember the statistic, in the last year of Obama's uh, power, the, it was, I think it was more than a billion dollars in arms sales to one country in particular. Um, <coughs> are there any more questions? I yeah. stole five minutes of you your time and Karen's time with my introduction, so I think your we're going to... sexist eyes have overlooked two women. We're going to postpone Karen with two or three minutes, and, uh, and you go ahead. Um, you spoke about a reform in Islam, and my question is, how do you suggest having a reform in Islam when it internally is so split as well, and you kind of have this internal schism within Islam as well? I, I think that, you know, um, Muslims are going through the same process that others did, that colonialism prevented them from going through, and that authoritarian regimes who manipulate religion and control education and the mind, okay? Um, when Jews went through it, you wound up with ultra-Orthodox Jews, Orthodox Jews, conservative Jews, 
Reformed Jews, Reconstructionist Jews, okay? When Christians went through it, you wind up with Catholicism and a billion, you know, other, I mean, you know, a, a lot of other religious traditions. This engagement is only occurring now. Uh, it, it, is, it, it, is, it is very thriving and ripe uh, in, in some Western countries, certainly in the U.S. and to a certain extent in some European countries, in terms of uh, some religious leaders, but particularly more and more uh, scholars of Islam, basically dealing with the tradition and saying, okay, what, what's, where's the baby and where's the bathwater? You know? uh, what can be changed, what needs to be changed, and what cannot be changed? And you see that kind of reform. I'll just give you one example. You know, we often say conservatives versus, you know, the reformers or progressives. Actually, it's tr trickier than that. One of, the, one of the very conservative, would usually be identified as conservative people, um, uh, a, a, a Qadawi, who's, a, who's big, not only in the Muslim world, but in America and Europe in terms of a following. You talk about women's rights to Qadawi, He's completely open on women's for education, women for employment. It may help that he has four daughters as well as a son, I think. Um, but, I mean, on a number of issues, you do have both reform-minded who will mine, use a different methodology to come up with the reason why you can do X, Y, and Z. For example, some, a, a number will say that unless something is absolutely required, everything else is an interpretation. So the great scholars of the past, if, if this isn't rooted clearly in a clear text in the Quran or in, in the Hadith, uh, then that's just an interpretation. What we got of a lot of interpretations. I think that that's really where it comes from. And did you want to say something? Quick. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask, um, you referred to earlier, um, it being 20 or 30 years in the light of the end of the tunnel. Um, in what way do you think we can encourage this process, given that events like this, in a way, are preaching to the converted? You're yeah. uh, hugely important, but they're talks to people that are probably more open to dialogue between religions. How do you, for example, in America, how do you approach trying to explain to people who are completely convinced that Islam is the devil incarnate that maybe that is a dialogue? How do you sort of get education to those people? One of, one, of the conversation, one of the conversations that Karen Armstrong and I had last night, and I, I see her a lot, okay, is that um, I sometimes ask why. I've been doing this for 40 years. I have more than 3 million miles, you know. I'm feeling it, okay. And it's like, why am I doing this? You know, what, well, the fact is somebody's got to get out there, you know. And some people will say, yeah, but you could be selective about your audience, you know. Why go speak at universities? What's going to really happen? You think one talk's going to change this generation or whatever? I think, I think that what you need are more and more people getting involved. And what I'm saying is, is that the good thing is that perhaps as things get worse, people will mobilize across society. A friend of mine deals internationally, and he was talking to a guy in an African country that was just about ready to be flipped over. And it seemed to him that his, his colleague didn't seem concerned enough. And the colleague said, sometimes a crisis <coughs> brings a sharper focus on what the reality is and, and gets people to mobilize. And I think that's really what we're talking about. If you're interested in some of this stuff, look at bridge.georgetown.edu. Bridge.georgetown.edu. You'll see all kinds of stats and studies on some of this. Thank you very much, Tom. You, you said your mind was not working exactly as it used to be, so I, I wonder how your mind is working when it's actually working. Uh, thank you for your uh, questions. Uh, I'm jealous. When I was a student, I, I used to be a student at Oxford, and my English is so bad compared to you students, so I'm, I, I'm impressed by you. Um, uh, let's just move forward, and uh, again, I have the great pleasure of... Uh, reintroducing uh, Karen Armstrong, who is perhaps most known in Norway for her international bestseller, A History of God. She has written extensively on both uh, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. Uh, and uh, the title of her address is uh, The Quran as a Holy Text, Wholeness and Meaning. And she will uh, take you through uh, an argument will eventually lead with uh, uh, the Quran's message as being one of uh, unity and compassion. Um, so I, I won't waste your time, Karen. Just give her a warm welcome, please. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to start by going right back to the 1980s at a time when I was still, before I got into any of this, and while I was still very hostile to religion after a difficult experience religiously as a young woman. I was in Palestine, Israel, um, and one night I was driving around the West Bank with uh, a car full of young Palestinians. They never went near the mosque. Uh, they were drinking beer, um, and we were just having a, a raucous time. Then suddenly, on the car radio, the Quran came on. Now, if I were in London with a bunch of beer-drinking, secularized young men, um, and the Bible came on, a Bible reading came on, someone would uh, lunge immediately for the off button. But these young men were transfixed. Uh, their eyes filled with tears, and they were trying to tell me what, tried to translate it for me. They were saying, oh, Karen, I wish you could hear this. It means this and this. And then someone would say, no, but it also means that. Because uh, Arabic is a very multivalent language. It, you, it has many, many levels of meaning. And the sound, it was being chanted, of course. It's so beautiful. Um, and I remember thinking, there's, there's more to this than meets the eye. And one of the problems we have when we read the Quran, we're reading like modern Protestants. Uh, Protestantism has a different relationship with its scripture from virtually any other. Why? Because it, uh, Protestantism coincided with early modernity, the beginnings of the modern period, um, and the printing revolution, Gutenberg. Um, which enabled everybody, eventually, to own a copy of the Bible, and increasing literacy enabled them to read it. Um, and Luther came up with the strange and, I think, difficult idea of saying, sola scriptura, only scripture. Never mind tradition or rituals, etc. Scripture alone. No one had done that before. You always everybody listened to their religion, like that young ma those young men. Uh, the, the earliest, uh, one of the very earliest scriptures were the Indian Vedas, and they were not written down until the 19th <laughs> century. Uh, they, the, 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 the Vedas began in 1500 BCE, uh, but there was a ban against putting it in writing. Uh, it was sacred sound. And uh, so, when people say, well, I, I had a little altercation on the radio with Tony Blair, who said, well, I've, I've read the Quran, and I see that uh, Islam has a problem, and I'm, the, I'm going to go into the Muslim world and reform it. I uh, shuddered at the thought. Um, but he has not read the Quran. I have been studying Islam now for nearly 30 years, but I haven't read the Quran either. I may know it very well in translation, but uh, to listen to it, the experience of it, uh, is sound. It's sacred sound. And I think it's very important when we're trying to come to grips with something to realize the, the, the limits of our knowledge and to realize that perhaps we, 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 we shouldn't be too omniscient in, in what we say. Um, certainly, as a Catholic, um, we sang our scriptures. We didn't read the Bible much. I, I was a nun, and we used to chant the divine office. Now, some of those psalms are pretty violent. Um, in Latin, they sounded fine. <laughs> um, then came the dreadful day when the Vatican said, we're going to do this in English now. And if you can imagine a huge church full of polite nuns uh, warbling, Oh, God, smash their teeth in their mouths. <laughs> you can imagine, we, we, we just stopped in our tracks and shook with laughter. Because, in a sense, the meaning of this had not been the essence of it. 
Uh, it was also the whole experience of chanting. And uh, because, of course, the Quran is a, is, it's a great art, Quran recitation. People go and listen to that uh, as, they, as they do to a, hear a famous diva it comes to town. Uh, it's a, it, and, it's, it's, and music uh, and chant, uh, we respond to it with a different part of our brain. Uh, it's a right brain activity, which is much more intuitive and multivalent. Uh, the language comes from the left brain, and it's more about meaning, and making distinctions. So uh, we had, we had a different, and actually the Latin was helpful in a way, because it reminded you that this was not an ordinary conversation. You weren't having a chat with God as you would chat to your boss, or you were, you were, this, was, uh, this was something else, a little reminder that we're talking about something else. Now, um, when the Quran came down to the Prophet Muhammad in the 7th century BCE, most of the Arabs could, could not read. Um, Muhammad himself was, as he Ummi, uh, he was a prophet who was not literate. But they had a very strong ear for poetry. Every year at the time of the Hajj festival, there would be a big poetry festival in Ukaz near Me Mecca, um, where uh, they had a very fine-tuned ear to uh, the different levels of meaning and to the technicalities of, of listening. We don't listen very well now. Um, uh, we, we, re we rely so much on the printed world, we don't memorize, we don't listen. And the first Muslims uh, who converted were less converted, it's, if you read the sources, by the actual message of the Quran than by the actual beauty of the Quran. It's a famous story of Omar, who became the second caliph, um, who was virulently opposed to the new religion. Uh, but one night, he went into the Kaaba, which this, that cube-shaped shrine that you see in the heart of Mecca, which was, at, was then, as it is now, covered by a great uh, covering, silk covering damask covering. So he got underneath and he heard, saw the prophet was there uh, chanting, praying to himself in, before the Quran, before the Kaaba. So he got under the covering and inched his way around until he was standing behind the covering and just in front of the prophet. And then he began to listen. And he said, and this is the important thing, he said, and then Islam entered into me and I wept that emotional response that music, uh, poetry arouses within us, but out of the sheer beauty of, of this extraordinary scripture. So saying that you've read the Quran, even in what I'm sure is going to be an excellent Norwegian translation, is rather like saying that you've uh, read Don Giovanni. Uh, or you've read the libretto of an opera, but you, have miss, you haven't heard the music. Uh, that is all part of the experience. And people often complain about the Quran. They say, oh, it's so repetitive. The same old phrases come up again and again. And okay, we've had that message once, you know, two surahs back. Why are we going through this again? This, uh, such repetition is exactly the mark of an oral scripture. Because uh, people who go to the mosque and they listen to the Quran, they don't buzz home like Protestants and have re read it silently. They listen. And, and, and certain patterns of words and phrases that seem repetitive when we read it uh, make connections between different parts of the Quran and get linked somehow in the minds of listeners as they listen over a lifetime. And also certain words are repeated. Like uh, every, every, every uh, reading of the Quran, every recitation begins with, with the Bismillah, in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. Uh, so compassion, mercy, forgiveness, courtesy, kindness, friendship. 
uh, recur again and again and become uh, sort of embedded in the mind of the listener as you listen over a lifetime. Now, jihad is not one of those words. Uh, jihad is mentioned only, is used only 47 times in the Quran. And in only 10 of those instances, in those times, does it refer unequivocally to warfare. Um, the word Quran, uh, jihad means effort, struggle. Um, and it's a struggle sometimes to give somebody food when you have little yourself. The Quran is calling. The bedrock message of the Quran is not the, to conquer the world. or uh, The bedrock message of the Quran is that it's wrong to uh, build up a private fortune and good to share your wealth equally, fairly, and to create a just and decent society where poor and vulnerable people are treated with respect. Um, and so uh, the jihad is on the last day, you will be asked not what you believed. The Quran has very little time for uh, theological orthodoxy, which it calls zanna, self-indulgent guesswork about matters that nobody can be certain of one way or the other, but which makes people quarrelsome and stupidly sectarian. Uh, he, this is pure zana, uh, sometimes the Quran says, when he's it's answering some of its, uh, its opponents. Uh, no, the, the, it's not what you'll believe, but on the last day, did you look after the poor? Did you h hoard your wealth? Did you uh, share what you have? Were you, were you cruel? That's what you'll be asked on the last day. And it's a jihad to do that. It's a struggle, especially in, a, in a, uh, an economy uh, like Arabia, where the, most people were living on the brink of, mal of starvation and in a state of malnutrition. There just wasn't enough red resources for food to go around. Um, and most of those uh, references to jihad are about the effort or the struggle it is to behave with sabra, with uh, patience when you are persecuted, as the Muslims were being persecuted in, uh, in, in Mecca before they made the, they made the uh, migration to, uh, to Medina. They were, uh, so the, and the Quran tells them not, that they must be patient and take it, not retaliate. Um, the, the, the people of God are they who walk quietly upon the earth. And when the aggressive people insult them, say, salam, peace. That's a jihad. <laughs> it's difficult to do that when you want to give this person a, 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 a left hook, a punch on the nose. But you do it with, with gentleness and courtesy. So, but scripture, once you've got a scripture, and, and the Quran is the scripture, it requires interpretation. And people, I was at a, a very posh conference uh, for very uh, highfalutin businessmen last summer. And one of them was saying, said to me, and he had tears in his voice almost with the sort of, uh, sort of emotion that he was feeling. He said, look, we Christians, he said, we interpret our scriptures. But Muslims don't do that because it's the word of God. They can't. And I said, look, what planet are you living on? <laughs> I mean, any um, Muslim library worth its salt, its shelves are absolutely groaning with the level of commentaries. It's the commentary on the Quran is the great Islamic science. And we're not talking about little slim volumes. We're talking about 30 volumes, uh, the, one of the most famous ones, uh, just going word by word on the Quran. And that in itself is it, it, it's, it's part of the way you appropriate your scripture and make it speak to your time. Uh, because uh, I'm writing a book about scripture at the moment in all religious traditions. And one of the things that we've got wrong since, uh, since the modern period, we keep going back to origins. And was that the original text of the Quran? Was that the original text of the Bible? Uh, scripture, until uh, we had sola scriptura, was always a work in progress. You had made it speak. Each, each religious tradition 
is a, for, is a dialogue between um, a, an immutable, everlasting, eternal, and uh, unspeakable, un, un, indescribable reality, whether you call it God or Brahman or Tao, and changing circumstances on the ground. If you're, you can't go back to the seventh century. Uh, we're living in the 21st century, and that message has to be interpreted in such a way as to speak vibrantly to that. I think it's helpful uh, to, for those brought up in the Christian world uh, to compare uh, the Christian scriptures uh, with, uh, the, uh, with the Quran. Um, in, uh, in, in, in Christianity, the word of God is the Quran. This, when you say these words, these are somehow, in some ineffable, mysterious way, these are some way, uh, some, the words that came to uh, the Prophet Muhammad uh, in, 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 during the revelation. That is the word of God. For Christians, um, it's the, uh, Jesus is the word of God. And the, um, the Gospels play rather the same role as the Hadith in, um, in, in Islam. Uh, after the, 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 in, the, in the centuries after uh, the, the Prophet's death, uh, new, new questions were arising and people collected sayings or uh, anecdotes uh, traditions, hadith, uh, from people who had sp they'd heard the prophet say something that would throw light on those situations. So the hadith are an early form of commentary on the Quran, an attempt to make it speak to contemporary circumstances. And the Gospels, you can see, you've had Jesus, the Word of God, the, rev the revelation, and the Gospels, written long after Jesus' death, are, as it, in a sense, hadith. Uh, and that Jesus remains at the center of this. And Muslims can, when they recite the Quran or memorize it, taking it into themselves so that it enters into you and you weep, as Omar says, because it touches you. It's the, it has the, sa it's the same as some Christians experience with the Eucharist, where you take the bread that symbolizes Christ into your being. Um, and there is some form of communion there, uh, some symbolic contact with the divine. Um, now, let's look at jihad, as that's, you know, what we're always hearing about. Um, the prophet, uh, people always say, well, he was a warrior, the prophet. Uh, Jesus wasn't. Jesus had the luxury, if you can call it that, of not being head of state. Um, states are inherently violent however, and forceful. However uh, peace-loving you say your state is, um, no state ever can disband its army. Um, and as soon as Medina, he went to Medina and uh, it became a mini-state, and then they had to fight the Meccans who were bent on exterminating the Muslim community. It was a fight to the death. So there is some stuff about fighting, etc. Um, but always a reluctance. Um, one of the earliest about saying fighting is permitted for you now, after all this talk about uh, sabra, patience, fight it, fighting is permi permitted for you, though it is hateful for you. Though you, a lot of Muslims didn't want to do that and self-defense. Now, the one I want to uh, talk about is the one everybody always quotes. It's known as the sword verse, though it wasn't called that for a very, very long time after the prophet's death. And it's the one where you have, uh, slay them wherever you find them, slay the unbelievers, you know, even in the, in the presence of the holy mosques, go in there and slaughter them. People are always uh, citing that to me, showing how this is a direct command from God and therefore, uh, you know, Muslims are bent on slaughtering people, unbelievers, wherever they find them. Um, the earliest commentaries, however, uh, for the first two or three hundred years, insisted that that had applied only to one el 
incident in the life of the prophet. That was when he had, was beginning to patch up relations with Mecca. And the Mecca, he'd made a treaty with them the year before. And one of the, the terms of the treaty was that the Muslims would be able to come to Mecca and make the Hajj pilgrimage. And, uh, and the, Mus the Muslims were saying, well, what do we do if we come in like lambs? Because on pilgrimage, you're not supposed to carry weapons, really. Or be, we're just like sitting ducks. Uh, we go into Mecca and th th they'll, they'll slaughter us. So the Quran says, yes, permission is given to fight, if you, but only if you're attacked first. Uh, and, even, and you'll have to do it even in the presence of the holy mosque, uh, the Kaaba, if you are attacked there and then. But the first, and, and the first commentator said this applied only to the first, that, that incident. It does not apply to Muslims today. And anyway, they said there aren't any unbelievers in Mecca these days. Uh, in the, so it, it's obsolete, that verse. It came into play a little later for reasons that I'll... I'll explain. Now, there's very little about martyrdom in uh, the Quran, about one verse, I think. Uh, but later, uh, Islam became an empire. And uh, empires depend upon territorial expansion by war. Uh, they, empires have always done that, uh, and I include the British Empire. Um, this, this, uh, this is by a sort of forceful thing, and so here they were. It was a great problem for Muslims, because an empire is, of its very nature, unequal. What's happened to the equity of the, of, of the Quran? And Muslims puzzled about that. I can't go into the wonderful solutions they came up with, but they had an army. And one of the hadith that you're always hearing about, about these 72 virgins and all the uh, wonderful things that will happen to you, they're sitting in golden crowns. And if, the, uh, this hadith was regarded, hadiths are very much graded by uh, how authentic they are. And this was seen as a rather very iffy uh, hadith indeed. And it, 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 the people who transmitted this hadith uh, were all connected with the Umayyad imperial government. This was a bid to get people to join the Umayyad army. Uh, a not popular vocation, but look what will happen to you if, if you die. The 72 virgins, etc., are waiting for you. Uh, it was not, uh, it's been used by uh, bin Laden and others, uh, which shows how, how very little they know, in fact, about the Islamic tradition. Now, let's just look People are always saying to me, well, that Muslims are actually addicted to jihad. Let's just look very quickly at the Crusades. Uh, in 1099, the first Crusaders uh, arrived outside the gates of Jerusalem. Half crazed, I'll give them that. Uh, as an excuse, because uh, they, they, they'd had an appalling journey and they died like flies during the last three years. But they fell on that city. And the chroniclers tell us that in two days, they slaughtered 30,000 people. The chroniclers, the eyewitnesses said, the blood came up to the knees of the horses. Now, addicted to jihad, uh, as Muslims would be, you'd expect that the riposte to this would be appalling. The cro our Arab chroniclers, the contemporary chroniclers, are horrified. They'd never seen violence on this scale before. Um, and they, but uh, they, they never thought this was a holy war. They just assumed that the crusaders were just out for money and uh, territory, as usual. And now you would have thought that there'd have been a massive repast. Not only were all those people slaughtered, but Jerusalem is the third holiest city in the Muslim world. Not a bit of it. There are a couple of pathetic demonstrations in Baghdad, and the Crusaders set up states, uh, little mini-states, the first Western colonies in the Near East. And uh, there, there were crusading rulers there, and, period, and the... Uh, Local emirs went on fighting one another, as usual, for territory and, uh, and, and wealth. And very often they joined, they'd make treaties with the crusaders uh, and they'd fight alongside one another. 
Uh, it was 50 years before the Second Crusade arrived when the Muslims saw these, this vast number of soldiers pouring out from the West. They thought, oh, look, this is getting beyond a joke. Um, and so Salahuddin, Nuruddin and Salahuddin began to revive the jihad. As they, it took them 50 years to do so, of really hard graft before uh, th this, this could take hold. Jihad was dead in the region. It had been replanted there, uh, and it has never entirely left, uh, but it came as the result of a sustained assault from the West. And when the Europeans arrived, the colonialists, uh, and when uh, the first bombs fell on Baghdad in the Gulf War, the cry went up, Salavia Crusade. Uh, they, they, that memory was recalled. And now the sword verse came, uh, it was, it was started to be called sword verse uh, at the, um, uh, in the, about the 15th century, for the first time, when you had the Mongol attacks on one side, and from the west, crusaders, crusades were still coming, so the Muslims were in a pincher movement, and they got more aggressive. Uh, because they were under fire. So, there's lots of more to talk about, of course. Um, and um, th there's the issue of women. Um, Quran has nothing to say about the veiling of women. Uh, that that is, came in afterwards. Women, are un are in no... There's no religious tradition that has been wonderful for women, because these were male organizations. Uh, but the Quran gave, gave women rights of inheritance and divorce, legal rights, which Western women, ha women wouldn't have until the 19th century. Not perfect, but compared to the way women were treated in pre-Islamic Arabia, with no human rights at all, this was a great advance. And... Um, it, it's very important. People are always saying, well, the, 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 the people depend upon the Quran for, for things like uh, you know, certain laws were, are promulgated there. The Quran is hopeless as a source of law because it makes uh, an injunction, like, you know, a, a thief must be punished, but then always goes on to say, but if he repents or says his prayers, then, okay, it's all over. And pe when people quote the sword verses or uh, these more jihadi verses, uh, they always n leave out this bit where uh, the Quran says, yes, you, must, you, you have to fight if you're attacked or permission, we have to fight now because it's in self-defense. Uh, but then it says, but if they lay down their arms, then you lay down yours. For or forgiveness is better for your soul. It's better if you sit down and talk about it rather than fight. All that Bin Laden and co. would leave out. And similarly, the Bernard Lewis's of this world would also leave, leave this out. So, uh, similar, so with things like polygamy, for example, uh, this came down to the prophet uh, after a, a, a battle in which there'd been massive, uh, with Mecca, in which there'd been massive Muslim casualties. And there were a lot of unprotected women. And so the Quran says, uh, well, you better marry some of these women. You couldn't survive as a woman in, in Arabia, a very, very violent place without male protection. Take up to one, two, three, four. And then he said, then it says, and that was a real, that was a tough one, because in Mecca, the, before uh, the coming of Islam, uh, people, Meccans could have as, men could have had as many uh, wives as they wanted. And they didn't take them into their own homes and support them. They were left in their father's house, and the man would go and visit them for sex whenever he chose and just was carefree <laughs> with the rest of the time. He didn't have to bother about kids and domesticity. Uh, the prophet is saying you can only have four, and then you have to bring them into your household and look after them. No mean feet. Then he says, but if you cannot be behave to them with absolute equity, then only one. And there are some Muslim countries that have uh, out forbidden polygamy on Islamic grounds because they say it's impossible to be that equitable. You'll always prefer one woman to another. They'll all, you'll always have your favorites. So this is, it is an injunction. 
So think, think along these lines. I want to finish. Uh, how am I doing for time? OK. Um, I want to finish on Islam's view of other religions, uh, because um, that's very much at stake here. Um, Quran acknowledges all the great prophets of the past. There's an extraordinary passage in uh, the Quran where uh, the Quran says, uh, you know, we, we see no distinction between any of them, Abraham, Noah, Moses, and some of the Arab prophets in, uh, in the pre-Islamic period. And Jesus is a great prophet in the Quran. And Mary is a prophet because she gave birth to the word of God. Um, and um, in the very famous uh, surah, uh, we have God is the light of the world. Uh, and light cannot be confined to a single lamp. Uh, it fills all lamps. And that's often been understood that every religious tradition has its own uh, valency. Uh, Jews and Christians were people of the book uh, because they too had received revelations and the Arabs had not had a revelation from God before. And I'm sorry to say, the Christians and Jews of the region uh, often sneered at them about that and said, yeah, you haven't had a, re a revelation from God. And this, this is why the Quran is very, say, this is an Arabic Quran. This is your, this is your scripture. Um, and there are constant injunctions. A, there must be no, con no compulsion in religion. No, very, 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 in very, very strongly worded Arabic, no compulsion in religion. And speak courteously to the people of the book, uh, except those of them who do evil. Say to them, we believe what you believe. Your God and our God is one. And so the Sufis, uh, the mystics of Islam, and Sufism was, until about the 19th century, the main uh, form in which Islam was lived out. Uh, not, that doesn't mean that everybody was a mystic. mystic. Very few people are mystics. But Sufi devotions, Sufi practices, Sufi social organizations were a, a, a principal way in which uh, Muslims all experienced Islam, just as Kabbalah. Uh, before the modern period, the mysticism of Judaism uh, was uh, the popular uh, religion of the ordinary people. And uh, Sufis, the, great, the Sufi poets, it's quite, have, have an outstanding appreciation of other faiths, I think unrivaled by any other tradition. It's quite common for a Sufi to cry in ecstasy that he's no longer a Jew, a Christian, or a Muslim. He is at home equally in a synagogue, a mosque, a temple, or a church. Because once you've glimpsed the divine, then you've left these man-made distinctions behind. And very early in my studies, when I was beginning to recover from my anger about religion, I came, I came upon two quotations. One of them was from the great um, poet and a uh, mystic of the 12th, 13th century, Ibn Arabi. Uh, and I came upon this, and after my very parochial uh, Catholic childhood, where we didn't even think Protestants were on the pale, and uh, this really spoke to me. Do not praise your own faith so exclusively that you disbelieve all the rest. If you do this, you will miss much good. Nay, you'll fail to recognize the real truth of the matter. God, the omnipresent and omniscient, cannot be confined to any one creed. For he says in the Quran, wheresoever ye turn, there is the face of Allah. Everybody praises what he knows. His God is his own creature. And in praising it, he praises himself. Consequently, he blames the beliefs of others, which he would not do if he were just, but his dislike 
is based on ignorance. And th when the prophet finally knew that his life was coming to an end, he made the Hajj and he gave his last sermon to his people. And he ended up quoting these words from the Quran, which are, I think, remarkable and speak essentially to our time. Oh, human, humanity, he says, yeah, oh, people, we have created you all from a male and a female and have formed you into tribes and nations so that you may get to know one another. Um, not so that we might convert or slaughter or conquer uh, or oppress or abuse, but so that we may get to know one another. That is the task of our time. What we're seeing now is people embedded in their nations. We're seeing a disease of na na nationhood. Very early in the um, uh, history of the nation state, the British historian Lord Acton in the late 19th century said that the nation state, with its emphasis on ethnicity, culture, and language, had a fatal flaw. Lord Acton said, with chilling accuracy, it could happen in certain circumstances that people who don't fit the national profile could suffer. And in some cases, they could be enslaved or even exterminated. And we've seen what ha has happened. And I, I'm, I am very disturbed. But I'm not into all this because I'm filled with peace and love, uh, but because I'm filled with dread at what may come. And the task of our time is uh, to get to know one another. If we don't manage to achieve it with the weaponry we've created, uh, I doubt whether we have a future as a planet. So, oh people, and this is a remarkable, from 7th century Arabia, which had had virtually no contact with the outside world, but was learning from it. We have for formed you, you're one. We have formed you from a male and a female, and formed you into tribes and nations, so that you may get to know one another. That's the task for our time. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Uh, I would like to thank you, Karen. I did not know until now that a lecture on the Quran could be simultaneously as enlightening, as entertaining, and touching as this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Karen Armstrong? There must be. Yes, yes. there's one. <laughs> and when you're given the microphone, please uh, speak up. It's there, there, behind the pillar. Hi, thank you so much for this lecture. It was really interesting and very moving, as Christian said. Uh, I, I just, uh, when you were speaking about getting to know each other, it reminded me of uh, something that uh, Frank Vilcek, the physician uh, who won the Nobel Prize in 2004, he speaks a lot about complementarity and about two opposite, really different truths standing uh, side by side and not sort of they're not the same at all but they are both sort of equally true mm. and I was just sort of reflecting on that when you were saying it my question is really simple do you um, are you hopeful for us uh, and if you are uh, what does this hope sort of encompass for you am I hopeful I I, I tend to be a depressive <laughs> um, I, 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 I'm not, I tend to be a, pe a bit of a pessimist. Uh, but am I totally despairing? No, I'm not. Uh, because uh, John mentioned earlier, sudden, suddenly 
all kinds of people were out on the street with Trump. That a recognition that this is not right, some kind of gut feeling, whatever, may not have had any interest in Islam or Muslims before, but this was not right. That was heartening. Um, and I hope that momentum increases. I have awful fears. I, as a, I speak as a British person. I know what we did in our empire. Um, I, and we would, if we had behaved with greater respect for the territorial and cultural requirements of the colonized people, we would not be having so many problems today. Uh, so, and, and too often, you know, we, we've got to see that uh, when I first went, I went to Palestine, you, I, uh, when I, I was would talking to, would talk to, I didn't know anything much about Islam, I didn't know anything much about the Middle East problem except the obvious things. But when I was talking to uh, Palestinians and Israelis, I found they had one thing in common, was but how awful the British had been. <laughs> um, and it was the one thing on which they all agreed. And I it began to see this is not just our prob their problem, it's our problem too. We helped create this. Norway perhaps not, uh, but uh, the... Uh, that march we saw in Paris, all those leaders, a rather strange bunch of leaders uh, to be uh, for, for marching for freedom of expression, but some of them, including my own prime minister, who was then David Cameron, um, headed countries that had for decades supported regimes in Muslim-majority countries that allowed their people no freedom of expression at all and were scrambling to get on the plane to go to the funeral of the Saudi king afterwards, to sh to, fine to show their respects, but they wanted to keep in with this regime. Uh, we've helped to create this mess. It's not just their mess. So, and, and it begins with, so it begins with an acknowledgement that it, it's not just a force that's come from outside. It's uh, been created for a long time, and we are in that this together. But you know, um, when I first wrote my first book about Muhammad, it was at the time of the Salman Rushdie crisis. Now, some of you were too young to remember this, uh, but it was at the time when Salman Rushdie, famous novelist, had written a novel about uh, the Prophet uh, and that was deeply offensive to Muslims. And, and th th there was a fatwa from Iran uh, to, out to authorize his. Assass his assassination, basically. Well, I was appalled by the fact, of course. But I was equally appalled by the way uh, leading intellectuals in Britain, in the news, in the media, segued from an out-and-out -out denunciation of the fatwa to an out-and-out -out denunciation of Islam itself as an evil and bloodthirsty religion. These I quote. And I said, we've learned nothing since the 1930s in Europe. It was this kind of talk that enabled Hitler to do what he did over, or, over a decade. And at the end of that decade, there were concentration camps again on the outskirts of Europe in Bosnia, this time with Muslims in them. And so, so I said I wanted to write about the prophet. I knew a bit about, enough to know that all this was nonsense, what they were saying, the evil, bloodthirsty. To, and I, for my own people, uh, to t tell them, because uh, there weren't any accessible lives of the prophet for Western readers. So I thought, well, I'll do it. And we couldn't find a publisher, because everyone expected me uh, to go join Salman in hiding. Uh, but it was, was, everyone said, well, Muslims won't <coughs> like it, you know. <laughs> they, um, <laughs> a Western woman writing about their prophet, huh? not a bit of it. Muslims were the first people to take me seriously as and there I am writing about their prophet and uh, greeted the book with that. That's a hopeful sign. Uh, and, you know, those sort of stereotypes about what, what, what will happen. So I think we ha we've, we've, what we must try and do, though, is to find more imaginative ways of expressing this. You know, every time there's some... Uh, atrocity or uh, either John and I come on the, the radio or the television and we're saying Islam is not a violent religion etc and no one takes any notice somehow we've all got to find ways of uh, appealing to the imagination of uh, Europe uh, and 
the West and the Muslim world. Uh, ways, visual ways perhaps, with using images like the Pope. Uh, I always say I never thought I'd hear myself saying these words, but I really like what the Pope is doing at the moment. <laughs> Um, he, uh, he, he has understood the art of the media to make a gesture that is photographed and immediately makes a statement around, uh, around the world. Somehow we need to use our imaginations, think outside the box, and we need to do it together. Inst instead of all little groups here and little groups there, joining these things up to find imaginative ways that will speak to the heart of people. Like John was saying today about how, um, how uh, we never speak about uh, the, the, the Muslim casualties. And you know, just before those Paris disasters in, in, in November last year, um, 44 Lebanese were killed two days earlier by two uh, suicide, IS suicide bombers in Beirut. No one mentioned them. No one thought of flying the Lebanese flag along the tricolor, or we were sort of say that. And this does not go unnoticed. Shortly after that, I was speaking in Amman uh, in Jordan, and a, a, a politician who was not a hothead, but he, he had brokered the peace treaty between Jordan and Israel. And he said the West has lost its humanity. It cannot, th it thinks only of its own dead. And I'd like to uh, get every time we hear of an atrocity anywhere in the world, say like when those 145 Pakistani children killed by the Taliban, realizing that Muslims are suffering from extremists as well, take flowers down to the Pal to Pakistani High Commission in, in London uh, and start building up an awareness that we, their casualties matter as much as ours, finding ways like that uh, to reach out, to get to know one another, realizing that they have pain too. Um, why do you think, you've, you've both used the phrase um, Judeo-Christian Judeo tradition um, compared to people of the book. Why do you think it's so hard for people, particularly in the West, to recognize that, that Islam is part of that same tradition, that they've got the same prophets and the same respect for, all, for the Old Testament? Why do you think people just can't get their heads around it? They see... Um, they see Muhammad as some completely alien figure that's just off doing his own thing and hasn't got anything to do with the same tradition. Why do you think people can't recognize that? Um, I think it's quite interesting that uh, people are able to relate to the past, but once you come on the scene and someone else comes along, that's more difficult to take. Uh, and Muslims have had their problems with this too, uh, in, with, with later uh, uh, forms of, of Islam, say, or Baha'i, for example. They found that using their scriptures. So it, it's, it seems to be something about these guys that come afterwards. Um, and uh, certainly in, the, in Europe, but in Europe certainly, uh, people saw Muhammad as some kind of Christian heretic. Um, but then Europeans didn't know anything. Uh, at that time, we were really like a third world country. Uh, and that was one of the reasons why we uh, loathed Islam in the way that people hate the United States today in, in the third world, because uh, we were, this was a great, great world power of gr far greater sophistication than anything. When the first crusaders arrived in, uh, in the East, they couldn't believe the sophistication and the, the cities that they were seeing. They had nothing like that at home. So resentment there. Um, and, and then it's complicated, of course, by politics. There, there's, the, the, there's the Israel-Palestine thing, which has, uh, has, has, I think is the heart of many of our problems. Um, and and, and we, we're in a, because if there'd been no Holocaust in Europe, they, they, this wouldn't have happened either. The, here again, we have to see, the, you know, we too are involved. Um, but I think it is something about being superseded in some way. Uh, you f people get chauvinistic. It's what Ibn Arabi said. Uh, their God is their own creature. In praising it, they praise themselves. 
Uh, they identify with that, and they belittle God. Uh, we can make God into an idol that we uh, uh, worship in our own image and likeness. Um, and uh, that we make it stand for ourselves, we identify with it, and we give this idol permission to uh, identify with us so that it sacralizes some of our very worst failings and hatreds. Um, and whereas God asks, it, it, what we mean by God, we never know, but it asks us to go to transcend all that and leave the self behind. Islam means this, it's surrender, not submission so much as sur the surrender of the ego. Uh, and that is uh, uh, sort of epitomized in the posture of prayer. Uh, uh, but there's always that bit of us that says, this is me. And uh, Judeo, uh, the Christians have sort of talk about the Judeo-Christian tradition, but what they mean is uh, they've kind of colonized Judaism, and there's something called the Old Testament, uh, which is very derogatory. You should call it the Hebrew Bible or the Hebrew Scripture, not the Old Testament, as though it's some old superseded thing, and then the new one comes along uh, as, a, as, a, as the answer to it all. Uh, th this is all due to ego, I think. Um, and, um, and, and too great an identification with our own petty little uh, religious ideas. Any other questions? I've silenced them. <laughs> you might believe it or not. Uh, so, um, you silenced me as well. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm going to uh, add some practical information, okay. but I suggest you give both John and Karen uh, an applause one more time. <laughs> so once again, thank you very much. Uh, it's been such a privilege and honor having you here. You've both been marvelous, and not only because you're knowledgeable, but because what you say matters. Uh, I'd really like to lock you up. <laughs> and, um, and my hope is there's a snowstorm coming up, so we have to abort <laughs> your flight tomorrow, and we will just stay in this room together for a day or two, right? Uh, well, there are alternatives. Um, as I told you, tonight, if you wish, come to Kulturhus at 7 o'clock, where Osten Seierstad will engage in a conversation with John Karen and Joseph Lombard. Joseph Lombard has just arrived in Oslo as we speak, and he will be here tomorrow giving the third lecture as a part of this program uh, entitled uh, The Quran, A Muslim Perspective. Joseph Lombard is a professor at the American University in Sharjah in the Emirates, and he is, has been a co-editor and translator of the Study Quran, which is a highly interesting project. It's both a new translation of the Quran, but including uh, uh, lots of commentaries made by Sunnis and Shias uh, in cooperation. So he will be here tomorrow. Um, uh, also, you have the chance to read more of John's and Karen's work, which are exhibited over there. Uh, and uh, lastly, uh, my patient colleague, Berit Lisa, in the corner, will sell you some tidden. Uh, Usually, some tiden, uh can be bought for the price of 149 kroner, kroner or kroner or whatever. Uh, today, uh, for you exclusively, for students, there's a discount, so you can buy it for 99 kroner. And uh, Karen um, addressed uh, jihad as a topic. Uh, there are uh, there is an uh, article about jihad, uh, trying to explain jihad as a concept, by Noura Egen, who's a postdoctor at this university, in some tiden. We have articles about the Quran and feminism, Quran and the environment, uh, and many other questions. So um, again, thank you for being here with us today. Thanks a lot to uh, the library for hosting this generously, and I'm, I'm really stunned for all, all, all they have done for this. And um, have a great day. Thank you. Take care.